Hello everyone. So this is the first uh, episode where we are discussing about the European penetration into Indian subcontinent, which were happening, you know, around 18th century, uh, just after the Mughal disintegration and when regional states were coming up as major power center. That was the time when uh, the various European powers like uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and obviously the English. and also the french they were actually coming uh, to the uh, coming through the various ports of india and they were you know trying to create a sphere of influences so here we are actually looking at the uh, european penetration into india but we are actually specifically focusing on the east india company the history of east india company till uh, they were actually struggling with other european powers so this will be a very brief and sketchy overview so uh, now i'm going to start without wasting any time so uh, the thing is that so if you kind of look at the first slide uh, the history of east india company and uh, to uh, elaborate that it was founded in 1600 as a joint stock company as i have written so what is the meaning of joint stock company that it there were many shareholders actually and the concept of joint stock companies were actually emerging in europe for the first time so east india company was a joint stock company that was established in uh, england during 1600 the company was also you know known as merchants adventurer at that time because uh, it was thought that they were kind of you know adventurers explorer who were trying to you know uh, discover the new routes uh, through india and through oriental trade so they were also called merchants adventurer so if you have any questions like uh, what were the other names of east india company at the time of establishment it can be you know merchants adventurer so what was the starting point of this east india company uh, which started penetrating into indian uh, trading uh, ports the first point is that in 1613 jahangir actually allowed a farman or a kind of it was a kind of uh, farman means you know it was a, a regulation uh, which allowed the east india company to set up factories at various uh, parts of indian subcontinent so f- the first english factory was at surat and you know by uh, so they got the farman in 1613 and by 10 years that is by 1623 uh, it had trading posts not only in surat but ahmedabad agra musalipatnam and various other uh, cities and you know there uh, with the establishment of surat uh it, it was the first english factory as i have already told but there was also a shift from surat to bombay as the you know main headquarter of western presidency because you know that because surat already had other uh, i mean other european powers at that time so uh, there was a kind of shift from surat to bombay in 1678 because the english were always you know trying to create sphere of influences at a place which were more safe and which were you know kind of where they can get rid of other competitors like other european powers so uh, there was a shift uh, by the time it had started creating trading post at ahmedabad agra or musalipatnam it there was also a shift in the uh, routes of trade from you know surat from surat there became uh, there came bombay as the main uh, hub trading hub of uh, it became a kind of main trading hub of east india company as i was saying so what was the nature of this trade uh, it was also a thing that when east india company was also you know uh, carrying trading activities in madras coromandel trade and this is very important because uh, it it was known at calico craze as i have mentioned already what is calico craze because there was a you know textile trade the calica textiles these had a very good demand around the world and so uh, the british actually the east india company they actually you know exploited this uh, whole uh, trading activities 
and they started exporting this calicut uh, textiles into various parts of the world and there was a replace there was a replace of this trade from spice trade to textile trade so how were this shift was happening actually what i'm trying to say is that in medieval period spice trade was a very important factor that how this whole oriental uh, businesses were going on but uh, we will see that with the uh, beginning of uh, 18th century there was a shift from textile uh, sorry a shift from spice trade to textile trade so this is very important when you uh, will be asked that what was the main uh, commodities uh, which were in circulation during 18th century so you should uh, actually mention textiles not spice trade spice trade also had a profitable market but it it was the new textiles uh, that was coming up as a you know major uh, thing in this early modern period so uh, what was the two main uh, east india companies uh, port and kind of also they were making forts uh, around certain cities because they needed to have a safe space uh, that it cannot be invaded by their competitors like the portuguese and french etc so the two forts of east india company in south india was visakhapatnam and kadal kadal okay so uh, in eastern india also they were setting up uh, factories like in orissa they were setting factories in 1633 and then in patna balasore dhaka etc so looking at this slide we will actually focus on you know the anglo french struggle in south india as i was saying that south india was also a very profitable trade route for both the uh, french and english and also the other uh, european powers like the portuguese and uh, the spanish so what was the first thing is that the maratha supremacy in west and alivardi khan strict control of east that is the gangetic region so these two power points uh, were already having a strong uh, regional leaders in west it was marathas and in east it was alivardi khans and the nawabs uh, the, uh, that was called the independent nawabi and everything so because of this uh, already blockening of power in east and west uh, what the european power were doing both english and french they were trying to focus on south india so this is the one of the reason that why south indian silk i mean south indian textiles were having a circulation in all over the world because that was the region that was the possible region that they could think of for a profitable import export trade i mean mainly export trade so the french east india company remember that east india company is not only uh, about the english but the french there was also french east india company i am you know using initials like eic uh, not writing the full uh, name like east india company so french eic was established in 1664 my if you can notice that it was established well after the english east india company because english east india company was established in 1600 but french east india company was established in 1664 and with its centers in chandornagar and pondicherry as you already know that in west bengal there is a, a small district called chandornagar which was actually occupied by french at that time and also pondicherry as we all know that it was a french colony so they had this headquarters at chandornagar and also pondicherry uh, unlike is english east india company the french east india company was actually government directed i mean the government decided that what would who would take over the uh, the leading positions within french east india company so the government actually regulated it the whole thing what will be the trade procedures who will be the stakeholders who will be in the position to decide anything so uh, unlike the english east india company uh, who had their own board of directors uh, which was a kind of a private company they also had private trade uh, the uh, the french east india company was government directed okay and so we will now actually look at that how the anglo french rivalry in europe was also impacting the anglo french competition 
in India as well because as they were competitors in their own subcontinent that is Europe so they also had you know trading uh, competitions in India which were heavily affected by their rivalry in their own subcontinent okay so uh, you know they clashed in various regions in mainly in Carnatic regions that we will come at uh, some point later that how in Carnatic regions this Anglo-French uh, struggle you know that took a very uh, big shape during this uh, 18th century so uh, in in terms of so as i was saying that duplex was actually the french governor general at pondicherry and you know he was very ambitious to drive away the english from india because they knew that english had better technologies and they were coming as a major uh, power centers in india so duplex the french governor general he was very you know he was ready to penetrate into the whole regional politics of india in order to drive away the english because they were the main competitors this time i will uh, just mention a few points that you know the time we are talking about that is the Ang anglo french struggle in south india this was the time when the portuguese spanish they already kind of lost their preeminence because uh, it was the time when the english and the french were actually coming up as a major you know trading powers of europe but not the portuguese and the spanish because uh, and also the dutch because they had their uh, time of flourishment but that was you know the in the previous centuries so uh, in these uh, i mean in this historical scenario we do not see so much intervention of dutch uh, and also portuguese and uh, you know the intervention of uh, spanish also because uh, they kind of they they are uh, trading supremacy kind of declined so we will actually now focusing on you know anglo french struggles so uh, as i was saying that duplex was kind of he had a conspiracy that how to drive away the english from india what did he do he became involved in carnatic and hyderabad internal politics to gain economic favor so how this was happening uh, let me uh, give you a uh, fine uh, you know background is that uh, the actually uh, what duplex was trying to do duplex in regional political scene duplex was favoring one uh, indian ruler over another so and at that way when uh, he was helping a regional king to gain support to you know to fight another competitor so when he became uh, the king then they obviously gave certain privileges to the uh, french governor so how it is happening it may seem a little confusing but if if i am going to tell you the examples it will be more clear so for example in carnatic region duplex helped chanda saheb to conspire against his political opponent so what was the political opponents of chanda saheb it was you know nawab anwaruddin so chanda saheb and anwaruddin had a very uh, you know uh, they had a very bad relation they had clash in the carnatic region so in these uh, struggles between two indigenous powers that is chanda saheb and nawab anwaruddin Chanda Saheb was supported by duplex and on the other hand Nawab Anwaruddin was supported by British so you can see that how in regional politics the european powers got involved by helping one and other uh, one and you know the, the regional leaders like this so uh, in this war, war which was called the battle of ambur in battle of ambur Chanda killed his rival Nawab Anwaruddin who was again supported by the British so uh, when Chanda became the uh, you know the head of that region he actually uh, gave the French East India Company 80 villages around Pondicherry as a sign of gratitude so because the Britishers were supporting Anwaruddin and he was already killed and this is this whole thing is also called the second Anglo-French war you know so and also in hyderabad duplex helped muzaffar jung to become king as a result of which they received huge grant like town of musalipatnam and territories near pondicherry so in this light what we are actually learning is that this is a uh, this is a way to create you know indirect uh, 
influences that you the french and the english they were actually helping the regional uh, kings with uh, you know with uh, trained french forces and trained english forces and in return when these regional powers uh, regional kings were uh, you know getting into their throne they in return in, in as a sign of gratitude they were also kind of uh, providing many trade privileges or you know land grant uh, like the town of musalipatnam and territories near pondicherry so this was a very interesting way to create the sphere of influences in this uh, major cities of early modern india so how they were doing i'm again repeating that you know uh, by helping the regional kings this was a major uh, way to create uh, trading influences okay so uh, we have already learned that how in second carnatic war the english were defeated because you know chanda sahib killed anwaruddin anwaruddin was uh, sorry anwaruddin was killed by chanda sahib and you know anwaruddin was uh, supported by british so you know after the second carnatic war the english were actually uh, defeated they were uh, very uh, they were not in a very favorable condition but the things will going to change so in this slide we are seeing that how duplex faced opposition when robert clive a uh, east india company clerk occupied arcot arcot was the capital of carnatic so after second carnatic war the english you know didn't uh, just sit back to uh, appreciate their defeat they were actually trying to create another uh, world pool into this scene and they were and this was mainly leaded by robert clive who actually started attacking arcot the capital of carnatic region so in this time when they attacked the uh, arcot french were defeated and chanda sahib was killed you know chanda sahib who uh, was a winner in second carnatic war so dup and uh, be- after chanda sahib was called i mean chanda sahib was killed duplex was recalled from india because you know Uh, they were uh, he was defeated and he did not have a sphere of influences anymore so duplex was recalled that you come back from india by the french government because i have already said that how uh, french east india company was government directed so the du- uh, duplex was recalled in 1757 the french again attacked wandiwash in tamil nadu where english and french army collided so uh, this was the actually the third carnatic war at won the wash and after that the french were totally in devastation and it ended with english victory and peace treaty in paris so after the third carnatic war the english outcompeted the french and the english became most dominant european power to continue their trade influences in in, in india so uh, what we are seeing is that by 1757 it was the last uh, carnatic war that is the third also known as third carnatic war between french and english so and at the time the 1757 is the year that when english became the kind of the sole uh, european power to have influences in india because you know portuguese and spare spanish and uh, the um, dutch they were already gone from the scene and after this third carnatic war french were also out of the scene so now we will just focus on the uh, trade of east india company because as i have told that french portuguese and others were already out of scene so the nature of east india company street uh, there was a re export of indian textiles I, if i am going to elaborate this a little bit that uh, you know east india company uh, exported indian textile to uh, britain but after a certain point of time there was saying that uh, if indian textiles were going to flood the uh, british market then what about the indigenous uh, textiles of the britain that there were in britain there were also weavers who were actually creating uh, who were trying to create a market for their own goods right so if indian textiles uh, because of this east india company's trade the indian textiles were exported to british market so the indigenous weavers and the indigenous uh, uh, who were actually uh, 
trying to sell their own textiles in Britain who were British by birth they were actually creating problem that you know we cannot compete with Indian textiles so what British were doing actually they were re-exporting the Indian textiles to other European centers so let me clarify this a bit that when Indian textiles were actually exporting to various parts of a uh, British market so the Britishers themselves who were actually responsible for the trading of their own uh, wool and you know wool and cloths and everything they were saying that if Indian textiles is there we are actually losing our own market of wool and our own British clothes I mean own British textiles so what British government or the British uh, traders were doing they were re-exporting this Indian textile first they were uh, actually carrying this uh, text Indian textiles to British then they were re-exporting that uh, textiles into other uh, you know uh, other states of Europe so there was a re-export of this Indian textiles and this export trade also encouraged better shipbuilding technological advancement because you know uh, apart from Britain they were also re-exporting the Indian textiles so that they, they were getting more money and with that money they could actually make better ships better technology to you know explore more uh, region and to expand their international trade trade so this re-export of Indian textiles was a very profitable business for them they did not have to export the Indian textiles only to Britain but also to other uh, you know states of Europe and by this way there was a decline of Hindu sheep owners uh, in India the Hindu sheep owners who were actually having a very profitable time before uh, the coming of English and before the coming of European powers that is before 1600 there was a slow decline of this Hindu sheep owners in Coromandel region and also the decay of Musalipatnam because in the Musalipatnam was a major trade center at the south during medieval period but with you know the English East India companies trading activities the Musalipatnam which was a medieval uh, center of power it was losing its power uh, and also the Hindu uh, sheep owners were uh, not trying to have much more so this hind what these Hindu traders were actually now became they became the servants of EIC actually they have a partnership they will call partners they will be called but uh, not uh, if, if you go by the real nature of their relationship this was Hindu traders kind of became servants of the East India company but on pen on paper was they were partners so now the question is that can this company because the East India company had all company means uh, I'm talking about the East India company so East India company already had various uh, spheres of influences you know in south and already I have said in uh, east like Urissa so uh, can it be called a state because it, it was creating a spheres of influences and it was not only about trade so Philip J. Stain who is a stern who is a recent uh, historian who, who has done a recent uh, researches he said that the corporation was a government over its own employees so like it was like a government Juris, it had jurisdiction over English trade it had colonial proprietors like they were also ruling over plantation in Asia and South Atlantic region. I'm talking about the East India Company. They struck their own coins, they repressed rebellions and became a body politics on its own. And Stern said that uh, we actually uh, should more focus on the territory, the concept of territory that how much, how Indian subcontinent was slowly becoming a major sphere of influences for the British for the East India Company so uh, you know when uh, their territorial expansion was way more uh, I mean way more powerful in this time so uh, we cannot actually say cannot say that you know they were actually only doing trade because it was acting as a state so in recent historical research like uh, the research of Philip J. Stern the company was actually called a state so we actually uh, kind of say that in history in historical uh, jargon we say the company state we do not say that east india company only came here to do trade but they had a kind of structures of the state so where so they were a state of a kind 
ओके सो दिस इज द लास्ट स्लाइड दैट हाउ द कंपनी वॉज यूजिंग फोर्स एंड फोर्टिफिकेशन फोर्टिफिकेशन मीन्स दे हैड फोर्ट इन सर्टन रीजियंस लाइक फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन कैलकाटा दे हैड फोर्ट दे हैड फोर्ट विलियम्स एंड दे वेर ऑल्सो यूजिंग देर वॉज ऑल्सो फ्री यूज ऑफ सिपॉइज एंड पियॉन्स कैश एडवांस वॉज डन बाई कंपनी because you know uh, there were certain uh, weaving villages that were coming out weaving villages mean that they actually provided cash advance to the various weavers and they kind of became wage laborers to the company who could not decide the price of their own product so there was this whole procedure that how uh, during uh, before the british came the weavers they kind of making their own product and they had say over their own uh, market value of their product and how they are going to sell but when the east india company started cash advancing you know the weavers became coolies they just became someone who were wage laborers of the company and they were kind of uh, making the textiles making the cloth and just giving them to the east india companies uh, men and they do, did not have any right over the price regulation and everything so there was this transformation from weavers to coolies and this weaving villages i mean the, uh, the villages which were actually uh, owned kind of indirectly owned by east india companies where these weavers were uh, provided cash advantages these were called weaving villages and uh, by this time after 1757 when they already outcompeted other european powers we will see that how this a uh, weaving number of weaving villages were actually expanding the british were creating more and more weaving villages because by that it it will actually kind of uh, smooth smoothen their trading activity because you know uh, this was the time when they already had war with dutch uh, and french so they had a they were already at a financial loss because they actually as i i have already told that they kind of did three carnatic wars with french and also uh, the war in european region so they needed money and this weaving villages were you know kind of investment where they could actually get back the money from and the demand for indian textile increased in european market so uh, they were also kind of re-exporting to britain and as i have already told that how they were re-exporting that indian textile to other parts of the european subcontinent Chinese tea was imported in exchange of coromandel textiles so the indian textiles were also you know uh, china was also becoming a very viable market for uh, england for east india company there was healthy competition from chulia muslims who were tamils actually uh, they were an important indian ship owners community but we can see that with the uh, you know coming of the british with the coming of east india company this chulia muslims or tamil muslims in south india they were also facing some kind of uh, competition now after 1757 uh, i mean a lot before that the bengal conquest is very important because you know the calcutta will be the capital of east india company and uh, uh, later Uh, which will be kind of uh, bengal or calcutta will become the capital of the whole uh, india so there is obviously a background for that so hugli was a stronghold the hugli is actually a district of uh, west bengal hugli was a stronghold of portuguese traders and then it came under mughal and later under dutch so this is a, a little information that i am just quickly uh, i will cross over that uh, there was a war between mughals and east india company during 1686 when aurangozeb was in throne right so mughal reclaimed hugli that is in west bengal and the company fell miserably and now turned their attention to calcutta so uh, you know how calcutta became the uh, capital of india is because the uh, east india company could not actually have a hold over hugli which was a mughal stronghold right hugli is another district of east, uh, west bengal and it was basically a uh, it was basically very important port and very important trade route for the medieval in medieval period for the uh, mughals so in 1698 company acquired zamindari of sutanoti kolkata and govindapur and as as we all know that how this will going to be a uh, calcutta so sutanoti kolkata and govindapur this will jointly become kolkata 
and after 1698 there will be process that how east india company actually uh, created calcutta and bengal as their major center of power so this is basically in a very uh, in a very uh, short way to tell about the uh, you know the history of east india company into indian subcontinent but uh, although i have not you know uh, went uh, what happened after calcutta was established because that will be you know no more an early modern but the uh, beginning of a uh, modern period in india so this was the thing uh, if you have any question you can actually uh, write that in comment section if you have any opinion and feedback you can also tell me that uh, it will be very beneficial uh so thank you for watching